Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by AJC. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with Jewish Insider. You can sign up for Jewish Insider's daily kickoff by visiting jewishinsider.com. The Transatlantic Friends of Israel, or TFI, is a cross-party interparliamentary group dedicated to the post-war order of transatlantic security and cooperation. TFI is united in the conviction that Israel, the Middle East's only liberal democracy, ought to be understood as an integral part of this vital security, political, and economic architecture. We are delighted to be joined today by two members of the European Parliament and AJC Project Interchange alumni, TFI Chair Lucas Mandel from Austria and TFI Vice Chair Dietmar Koster from Germany for the launch of an unprecedented transatlantic declaration that unites lawmakers from North America, Israel, and Europe in their rejection of Europe's fictional distinction between Hezbollah's so-called military and political arms. After we hear from MEPs Mandel and Koster, we will hear from the Washington Institute's Matthew Levitt. Levitt, the author of Hezbollah, the global footprint of Lebanon's party of God, will highlight his latest research on the Iranian proxy's global terror activities. Daniel Schwamenthal, director of AJC's Transatlantic Institute, will moderate these two conversations. After we hear from our speakers, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or use the Q&A chat feature in Zoom. To conclude this program, we will also hear remarks from AJC CEO David Harris, who has led AJC since 1990 and has been a leading Jewish advocate on urging the EU to designate Hezbollah in its entirety as a terrorist organization. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you, Gillian, and a warm welcome to our worldwide audience. This morning, a truly historic transatlantic declaration of over 230 lawmakers from Europe, North America, and Israel across the political field was delivered to EU leaders urging them to finally designate Hezbollah in its entirety as a terrorist organization. Today's campaign launch comes on the eve of the twin anniversaries of Hezbollah's deadly bomb attacks on the Amia Jewish Community Center in Argentina in 1994 and an Israeli tourist bus in Bulgaria in 2012. Only yesterday, AJC interviewed Argentine President Alberto Fernandez who affirmed his commitment to apprehend and prosecute the individuals who planned and carried out the army attack that murdered 85 people. In 2007, the Argentine government concluded, concluded that of course Iran and its terrorist proxy Hezbollah were responsible for this atrocity. Follow, following the terror attack in Bulgaria, the EU listed only Hezbollah's so-called military arm as a terror group, leaving its so-called political arm free to continue operating in Europe. And today's declaration urges Brussels to finally designate the entire organization. And thus to do away with this false distinction, distinction even Hezbollah Secretary General Nasrallah himself rejects. Let's imagine for a moment if the situation were reversed Imagine there was a terror organization that calls for the destruction of Europe and that has carried out numerous terror and missile attacks against Europe. And imagine further that Israel allowed such an organization to raise funds and recruit supporters on its territory. It is, of course, ultimately unimaginable that Israel would behave this way towards her European allies. And yet, why is it happening the other way around? There is now evidently a growing number of politicians across Europe who are saying enough is enough. This, this declaration has over 230 signatures and we will continue to add new signatures throughout the German EU presidency. This initiative was spearheaded by the Transatlantic Friends of Israel, which connects like-minded lawmakers on both sides of the Atlantic, dedicated to strengthening the alliance between Europe, the United States and Israel. 
And I am delighted to welcome TFI Chair Lukas Mandel from Austria and Dietmar Köster from Germany, one of the TFI Vice Chairs, to this virtual press conference to discuss why we are seeing such a large and growing number of parliamentarians speaking out on Hezbollah. And it is not just the number that is impressive. Among the signatories from the European and national European parliaments are numerous members and chairs of foreign affairs and EU committees, party leaders, parliamentary vice presidents, a number of lawmakers who have previously served as president, prime minister, and foreign and defense ministers of their respective countries. Let me start by asking both of you, what are the main reasons why you helped initiate this transatlantic declaration? Lucas, maybe you go first. Thank you, Daniel, for uh, the moderation and for heading all of this and uh, for all the management behind this. Actually, this is uh, the right moment for this declaration and it's an important declaration because uh, it is a majority in European Union as well as uh, regarding the member states uh, and the European Parliament, which understands that relations with Israel are important, are of utmost importance since uh, Israel is the only democracy, the only rule of law state in the Middle East. And uh, we need uh, even much more coordination, cooperation, communication between EU and Israel. Uh, and uh, it's also a majority that understands that uh, security is of utmost importance for Israel. And I mean the Israeli citizens, uh, children, women and men, regular citizens. It's not something theoretical, it's something uh, that is relevant for daily life. Uh, but on the other hand, and that's where my feeling is that uh, words and action are not yet coherent uh, in our European Union. Uh, on the other side, uh, we create uh, an idea which is wrong about a, a political arm and a terrorist arm of Hezbollah, but Hezbollah actually is in its entirety, obviously, clearly proven many times a terrorist organization. And that's why we have to be clear about that. Uh, that's uh, actually uh, a minimum act of friendship and cooperation and partnership with Israel, that we understand that Hezbollah is a proxy of Israel's uh, biggest enemy, Iran, which tries to uh, not only defeat Israel, but to uh, delete Israel from the map. Uh, maybe Hezbollah is the largest proxy, the most dangerous proxy, the most brutal proxy of Iran. And that's why we have to be clear uh, as European Union, that's why we have to ban uh, Hezbollah entirely. Uh, and uh, not only one member state or the other member state, not only a majority of member states should do this, but of course each and every member state should do this. And also the European Parliament should be clear about that with a clear decision. Uh, frankly, I'm happy to say that in most cases, European Parliament uh, understands with its majority uh, the importance of uh, this uh, relation. Uh, not only the importance regarding Israel, so it's, but it's, uh, it's important for us as Europeans ourselves. It's important for European security, European wealth. And of course, it's, uh, it's uh, obligatory and mandatory in the framework of the so-called uh, European values we stress, uh, we stress uh, so often. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons. And the other reasons Hezbollah uh, is not only active in Israel or in the Middle East. His border is active all over the world, also in Europe, also in our towns and cities in the European Union. So it's also uh, on behalf of our local and regional uh, security to ban his border in its entirety. Uh, his border is using uh, our European Union as a hub, a hub for recruitment, a hub for fundraising, a, a, a hub for organizing crime uh, to finance terrorist activities. So Europe should not be uh, fine with uh, being used, misused hmm, as a hub uh, for something like that. And this is uh, one other reason. And uh, if I may share one personal experience, uh, I myself was standing at the border to Lebanon and I have seen with my own eyes how close uh, Hezbollah is to Israeli civilians and is heavily 
weaponed and armed uh, and is ready uh, whenever uh, someone decides to attack. And uh, this, this is also not only theoretical, but Israel from many sides, as we all know, uh, has been attacked for many years uh, from each and every side all the time. And that again means civilians uh, in Israel are affected by that. And these are the main reasons. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share this today. These are the main reasons uh, uh, that uh, for the fact that this declaration is of utmost importance for us as Europeans, for the Middle East and for the security of the whole world, actually. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, Dietmar, what are your main concerns? Well, um, thank you, Daniel, uh, for organizing uh, this important event. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. I think it's uh, a good start of uh, the ca campaign, Europe uh, must ban Hezbollah. And um, what Lucas has uh, ex explained, uh, I can only agree with this. I agree abs absolutely with Lucas. For me as a German and as a social democrat, the security of the state of Israel and the Jewish communities in Europe cannot be just talking points. The security of Israel and the fight against anti-Semitism is for me personal, a crucial motivation for all my political work. And I would say it's part of my stance uh, in all the uh, political work. And I think it is important to look a little closer into Hezbollah's deep-seated anti-Semitism. It is no coincidence that Hezbollah adopted the Nazi salute for its so-called military wing. The photos and videos of these terrorists calling for the death of Israel and Jews while extending their right arms from the neck into the air with a straightened hand is just shocking. It is important to understand that Hezbollah is not just an enemy of the Jewish state, Hezbollah hates all Jews. Just listen to Hezbollah's own leaders. Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah, for instance, said that, and so I begin to quote, if the Jews all gather in Israel, it will save us the trouble of going after them worldwide. Or another quote, uh, if we searched the entire world for a person more cowardly, despicable, weak and feeble in psyche, mind, ideology and religion, we would not find anyone like the Jew. Notice, I do not say the Israeli. End of the quote. Naswala also praised well-known European Holocaust deniers, David Irving and Roger Garoudi, on his baller's own TV channel, Almana. Mm -hmm. His deputy, Shaikh Naim Kazim, is infamous for saying the history of Jews has proven that, regardless of the Zionist proposal, they are a people who are evil in their ideas. End of the quote. The question, therefore, for me is not why we must ban Hezbollah, but how is it possible that we haven't done it already long ago? How is it possible that for decades we have allowed such a violent and hateful organization to operate so freely in Europe, poisoning the minds of young European Muslims? We know from German security services that there are over 1,000 Hezbollah supporters in Germany alone. The group's violent and anti-Semitic ideology is poisoning pluralistic and democratic societies. This is most visibly the case through Hezbollah's annual Al-Quds march, where calls for the annihilation of the Jewish state echo the darkest chapter of German of European history. Josef Schuster, the head of the Zentralrand, the German Central Council of Jews, said that Al-Quds demonstrations transport nothing but anti-Semitism and hatred of Israel. Ahead 
of last year's march in berlin germany's anti-semitism envoy felix klein even urged citizens to wear a kipper in solidarity with the jewish community and allow me to make an additional point as a radical islamist terror terror organization hezbollah is not only deeply anti-semitic their entire ideology runs contrary to democratic values. Hezbollah is a front group for the Islamic Republic of Iran to spread its Islamist dogmas that are deeply misogynist and homophobic. The Iranian re regime regularly hangs homosexuals from public cranes and it is so called and it's the so-called morality police harasses women on the streets of Tehran for not wearing or not properly wearing a headscarf. Again, we must listen to their own words and take them seriously. Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah accused homosexuals of destroying societies and slammed Western countries for exporting homosexuality to Lebanon. Homosexual, he said, relations defy logic, human nature, and the human mind, he declared. So again, if we really care about human rights, equality, and freedom, and the protection of the rights of minorities, here in Europe, we must designate Hezbollah. Thank you. Thank you, Dietmar. Um, we often hear, though, EU diplomats and, and, and politicians saying that um, designating Hezbollah uh, as a terrorist organization would supposedly destabilize Lebanon. Uh, Lucas, how would you respond um, to such a concern? Thank you for raising this important issue because uh, it's actually the other way around. It's clearly the other way around. What destabilizes Lebanon is Hezbollah. Hmm. So what has to be defeated to stabilize Lebanon is Hezbollah. So uh, it's, it's entirely wrong. It's, it's the completely wrong approach uh, to assume that uh, diplomatic relations uh, with uh, Lebanon or stabilizing Lebanon, Lebanon or uh, getting Lebanon in a uh, better uh, condition for being prepared for cooperation or partnership uh, would meet uh, any uh, relation with Hezbollah is absurd, actually. Uh, and that's uh, what I, each and every time when I hear this argument, try to point out. Uh, it's uh, the case that his border is part of the problem in Lebanon, and his border is uh, far away from being part of the solution. Solutions for Lebanon uh, in the first place need his border to be defeated. Uh, that's uh, my assumption on that, and uh, maybe just one uh, remark, by the way, which is relevant regionally and locally for us uh, in the European Union. Uh, Hezbollah, of course, uh, is also, uh, as a main actor, uh, responsible for the migration crisis, which we have to deal with uh, every day in Europe. So we should not uh, underestimate the role of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah is there a, a state within a state, uh, influencing uh, all fields of state and society and economy. Uh, it's, uh, of course, also corrupt, uh, uh, what's true for Europe as a hub for financing uh, terroristic organizations and initiatives and action is also true for Lebanon itself. So uh, this argument seems to be wrong and we can easily sort out what's really the case and the case is uh, Lebanon uh, is important, Lebanon has to be stabilized and uh, it's in the interest of the citizens of Lebanon and the regular people there uh, that Hezbollah will be defeated since Hezbollah there is a part of the problem, not of the solution. Thanks, Lucas. Um, Dietmar, um, another argument that uh, we often hear is um, that because Hezbollah, Hezbollah also operates as a political party and is part of the Lebanese government, designating in its uh, entirety would supposedly prevent the EU uh, and its member states from continued diplomatic engagement uh, with Lebanon. Uh, what would you say to those concerns? Let me start uh, in that way. The need for diplomatic relations with Lebanon can't supersede democratic values 
and security concerns. And there is nothing that could justify Europe being a safe haven for terrorists or their supporters. So for me, there are important principles at stake that can't be canceled. Having said that, those concerns aren't really valid in the first place. The idea that listing Hezbollah would automatically mean we can no longer have diplomatic relations with Lebanon is simply unfounded. Don't take my word for it, just look at the reality. Consider the real life examples for the US, the Netherlands, Germany, Canada, the UK, the Gulf Corporation Council and the Arab League who have all designated Hezbollah in the case of the US already since 1997. Nobody had to sacrifice their diplomatic relations with Beirut. As a matter of fact, there are critical voices in the US that believe Washington is too supportive of the Lebanese government and thus also Hezbollah. So no, this argument simply has no currency. All right. Um, well, I have plenty of more questions, but I see our uh, time is, is, is pressing. So uh, what I would like to do is to conclude this segment uh, for now um, and uh, turn to our, our next speaker. So thank you, first of all, Lucas and, uh, and Deepma, please don't go away. We will uh, get you back for the question and answer session. And uh, I would like now to um, invite our next speaker um, from DC, Matthew Levitt, once we have uh, his video. Hi, Matt. Uh, hey, Matthew Levitt from the, yes, very good. Good to have you. Um, Pleasure to be here. Matt Levitt from the Washington Institute. Matt really is the expert on his follow. Uh, specifically when it comes to um, the group's international terror and criminal activity. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Matt is uh, about to launch an absolutely fascinating project, an interactive map tracking all of his uh, Bola's global uh, activities that will be also available to the public, right? If I understand you co correctly. When will this go live, Matt? Uh, early August. Early First week August. of August, we hope. Just a kind of summer vacation reading <laughs> one is looking forward to. Um, Matt, in, in, in 2013, following the um, uh, Hezbollah terror attack in Burgas, Bulgaria, that killed uh, um, Israeli tourists and the Bulgarian bus driver. Um, so following that, in 2013, the EU banned the so-called military arm. Now, uh, has Hezbollah's behavior in Europe significantly changed since this partial designation? So first of all, uh, Daniel, let me thank you for inviting me to participate and everyone at AJC. And thank you for the important work uh, you and AJC uh, writ large are doing in the space. Um, as you know, I've made many, many trips to Europe on this issue, uh, many of them uh, in partnership with AJC. and. Uh, uh, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Look, a partial designation uh, is better than no designation. Uh, it provided some cover for member states to do things on the law enforcement level that maybe they had not felt comfortable doing before. But it is absolutely clear uh, both that a partial designation is insufficient and not only as uh, your previous speakers just said, kind of at a moral ethical principled level, but as a, at a practical level. One reason is that Hezbollah's behavior has not changed. Hezbollah did not see a partial designation where Europe makes distinctions between the wings of Hezbollah that Hezbollah itself doesn't make um, as any type of deterrence for its activities. If you look in the period post um, uh, July uh, 2013, you see example after example of Hezbollah activity in Europe. Consider the cases over the course of 2013 to 2015 of Joseph Asmar, who was arrested in France, and Iman Kobesi, who was lured in a um, law enforcement operation to the United States and, and, and arrested uh, in the United States. The two of them were running uh, money laundering, drug running, and other criminal networks around the world, but specifically they were bragging uh, to people they thought were part of the mafia, but were actually US undercover agents, about their ability to move money, launder money, and move drugs through Belgium, 
through Germany, through Holland, through France. They had a preference for doing certain things through Bulgaria. The list of countries around the world, and in particular in Europe, and the amounts of money that they were talking about were just mind boggling. And there are many, many other examples. I think the most important is the fact that the single most significant Hezbollah transnational uh, weapons procurement, money laundering, and fundraising um, network that Hezbollah runs today. And specifically, this network is about funding military and terrorist activities, not political campaigns, not social welfare programs, military and terrorist activities, weapons for its activities in Syria, etc., has massive European footprints. And, and based on the information that I've collected for this interactive map that you mentioned, I think that there's no place that has a bigger footprint than Belgium. Not every member of this network has a footprint in Belgium, but several of the most important have Belgian citizenship and more importantly, significant Belgian companies, which in turn have significant relationships and subsidiaries in places like West Africa and of course in Lebanon. If you look at the US designation of the Tajuddin brothers of Mohamed Bazi and less than a year later, uh, Wael Bazi, the Bazis both uh, in Belgium, Belgian citizens with at least three companies to their name. Uh, Nazim Said Ahmad, who lives in Beirut, but is a Belgian citizen and has also significant business interests uh, in, um, in Belgium. What you see is a really disturbing trend where arguably Hezbollah actually picked up the pace of their weapons procurement, money laundering, and fundraising in Europe in the wake of the designation in July 2013. Wow, so they picked up the pace. That's, that's, that's a little bit difficult to compute. I mean, surely a partial designation must have been better than nothing. I mean, it's a, no impact of it. Well, I would argue that there was some impact and there were some ways that, uh, that were positive. Uh, for the first time ever, you had a really significant transatlantic U.S. pan-European uh, uh, law enforcement operation targeting Hezbollah money, uh, money laundering and what was called Operation Cedar. And that led uh, to the uh, arrest, prosecution, and conviction in France of uh, several individuals, some of whom were just criminals, um, but at least two of them were very, very significant Hezbollah operatives. One of them, Mohammed Nuruddin, had already been designated by the Treasury Department. This is the first time, to my knowledge, uh, at least since the 1980s, uh, where France convicted a Hezbollah operative and referred to that person's activities as um, uh, uh, fundraising, money laundering activities in support of terrorist activity, and the terrorist activity here was Hezbollah. That said, if you look at Europol, the European Union's uh, uh, police agency, if you look at their latest um, counterterrorism threat report, um, it's very, very clear, and I'm going to quote to you from it. It's very clear that the Euro Europol itself sees the partial designation as insufficient. And I quote, the Lebanon-based Shi extremist organization Hezbollah, whose military wing is listed as a terrorist organization by the EU, is suspected of trafficking diamonds and drugs and of money laundering via trade in secondhand cars. This is in Europe. Capital is sent to Lebanon through the banking system, but also through physical transport of cash via commercial aviation. And here's the key sentence. Investigations face the difficulty of demonstrating that the funds collected are channeled to the military wing of the organization, end quote. In other words, money is fungible. And so if Hezbollah doesn't do us the favor of putting a stamp on the box saying, destined for a Hezbollah military organization, then within the EU, it's extremely difficult to prosecute such activities. Here you have Europol saying this. Uh, the European Police Agency. So I think there's an absolute imperative in pursuing both uh, a broad, complete uh, EU designation of Hezbollah in its entirety, but also pursuing national level designations of the type that we just saw in Germany and beforehand uh, in the UK, and for that matter, in other countries around the world, in South America and in the Gulf, for example, as well. I'd like to have one more point, following up on your earlier question, about whether or not a, a new designation would prevent member states or the EU itself from maintaining diplomatic relations with Lebanon. Mm -hmm. The authority under which EU designations are made is called Common Position 931, CP 931. Mm -hmm. All of your participants can go Google it right now. It's available in all of the languages spoken within the EU. 
CP931 is explicit. It does not ban contact. What this means is not just could every European Union official, parliamentarian, every member state uh, official and parliamentarian continue to have full and complete um, connectivity uh, with Lebanon. If they wanted to, I'd recommend against it, but if they wanted to, they could continue to have contact with Hezbollah. And there are Hezbollah parliamentarians. I'm happy to explain to you how non-parliamentary they are. But the point is under CP931, there is no legal basis. It's not just a moral or ethical question. There is no legal basis to make the argument that a full designation would in any way impede diplomatic relations with Lebanon. Right. Let me now, just going back to the, the earlier question, to, to drill this down. So if Hezbollah, obviously, will, will always say the money that we either, you know, raise through fundraising through, uh, or, or, or other activities, will of course always say this is going to, I don't know, some, some, some orphan uh, um, project. Um, and, and, and so without the full designation, it would be incumbent on EU security services police to prove that no, indeed, this money is going to nefarious activities. Uh, That's right. Is that, is that more or less the situation? So that they could transfer the money actually to some orphanage and if it's then transferred further to a military organization i mean it's, it seems to me it's almost would be almost impossible for for law enforcement to prove this in a court that this money actually ended up somehow for a terrorist activity daniel as you know i started my career in the fbi here in the right. united states and in the years i worked counterterrorism with the fbi I know of only one case one case where we were actually able to trace a dollar to mm. a bullet. Right. It's just that difficult because terrorist organizations understand our limitations and they understand why go say, hey, excuse me, will you fund the cost of a bullet? And why not just say, will you provide to this charity, wink, wink? And there are charities and they do charitable activities, but the money is also fungible. And it means that Europe right now literally has its hands tied behind its back with a law that says, theoretically, you can prosecute Hezbollah supporters for financing the group's terrorist activity, when in fact, the ability to do so is completely constrained. Right. Um, one further question, I think we, we still have time. Um, so, but, you know, we talk about Hezbollah po politicians and so forth. So is there truth to the, to the claim that there are different wings? And what does that really mean then? So Hezbollah engages in multiple types of activities. That doesn't mean that there are wings in Hezbollah anymore, that there are wings in Al-Qaeda or in Islamic State. Just this week, the U.S. Treasury designated an Islamic State charity in Afghanistan that was raising money support purportedly for charitable activities, but was financing the Islamic State uh, terrorist activities um, in Afghanistan. Uh, Hezbollah is much the same. Now, Hezbollah does have parliamentarians, absolutely. But I want to give you two examples from U.S. Treasury designations of two of the most prominent Hezbollah parliamentarians. And just to give you a taste of some of the non-parliamentary activities they're engaged in. So, for example, the U.S. Treasury designated Mohammed Raad. Mohammed Raad is a very senior Hezbollah political leader. Uh, Mohammed Raad, together with a Hezbollah uh, security official, Wafik Safa, maintained a list of 100 Hezbollah members who are to acquire foreign citizenship and then get foreign passports. And with these foreign passports, these individuals would be sent by Hezbollah on, quote, long-term missions to Arab and Western countries. And if we had the time, I could give you a long list going back to the early 1990s of cases just in Europe where this has happened in the past. This is what a Hezbollah parliamentarian was doing, identifying people who could get foreign passports mm -hmm. to go on long-term missions for Hezbollah. I'll give you another example. Amin al-Sheri, who famously was pictured with uh, the late Iranian uh, terrorist general Qasem Soleimani. Amin al-Sheri at one point went around threatening Lebanese bank officials and also their family members because the U.S. Treasury was uh, engaging in sanctions on Hezbollah. And he was going around, Amin al-Sheri was going around to family members and saying, listen, if your family member who's a Lebanese banker doesn't allow Hezbollah to maintain accounts and to facilitate transactions on behalf of Hezbollah, things could happen to you. 
threatening citizens whose family members are bank officials to allow illicit financing through the Lebanese financial system. Look at the Lebanese financial system today, literally on the brink of collapse or at collapse, not only, but in part because of the illicit financial shenanigans that Hezbollah has conducted for decades through those banks. As it gets to that earlier question you asked before, would taking action undermine Lebanon? Failure to take action allows Hezbollah to do things like using Lebanese civilians as human shields for precision guided missile factor factories, allows Hezbollah to engage in money laundering and other illicit financial transactions through the Lebanese financial system, which is the backbone of the Lebanese economy, undermining the Lebanese economy, look where it is today. Explain to me how Hezbollah digging a terrorist attack tunnel from Lebanese territory under the blue line into Israel is in the service of the interests of the Lebanese population, which desperately does not want another war. Right. Um, uh, thank you so much, Matt, for, uh, for clarifying all this. Um, I think uh, this is now maybe a good time to uh, bring back uh, Lucas and Dietmar's um, 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 audio and, and video and uh, to turn it back to, to Jillian for some questions from our worldwide audience. Jillian? Thank you, Daniel. We're, we're receiving a lot of questions from our live audience. Um, this first question is for all three panelists, so whoever would like to respond. Um, it's from Dale Ginsburg in Cincinnati who asks, has there been any practical change in momentum since the German ban on Hezbollah? Perhaps Maybe. I can. Yeah, yeah. Deepma. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it is really an uh, important step uh, in the fight against the worldwide anti Semitism and in, against the terrorist uh, Hezbollah that the German government has decided to ban Hezbollah. And uh, I hope this could be an example for the other European uh, member states. And um, in the next uh, month, uh, we have the German presidency of the European Council. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, the German presidency will use a kind of momentum uh, to, to, to strengthen the fight against uh, Hezbollah and uh, their terrorist activities. And um, I think uh, this would be very important. And, and uh, I'm, I hope uh, that uh, the German presidency will put this on the agenda. I know well there will be a, a big event um, against uh, anti Semitism, uh, mm. but we are uh, at the point where we must go further on. We know well uh, that uh, Hezbollah, we cannot um, uh, differentiate them between a political and uh, uh, military arm. Uh, I think now we have the situation and now uh, there's a good chance to, uh, to ban Hezbollah and uh, I hope uh, that we can achieve. I think uh, uh, Lucas has mentioned it in the European Parliament, uh, we will achieve a majority. Uh, but uh, there is a problem that we uh, must need uh, the unanimity in the European Council. And uh, this is uh, what uh, makes it a bit different, difficult. Right, right. Now, I'll, this transatlantic declaration is of hopefully going to, you know, uh, help the German presidency uh, to, to raise the issue uh, in the council. But uh, failing a consensus, uh, if I may, may, may add on to this question specifically to look at, you know, there, there, we, we would hope that at least other individual member states would, would follow the example of Germany um, and maybe um, initiate a national ban. Do you think Austria could be next? Thanks for the question. I highly appreciate the German decision, but not only the decision, but also the action. Because the police forces in Germany, uh, 
the authorities of German administration immediately after this decision acted, uh, since there were uh, specific places where Hezbollah terrorists were present and active in Germany. So they did something as well. Uh, and of course, this uh, must also happen uh, whenever such a place uh, would be known in Austria. Uh, Germany has a decision by the government. Uh, as a parliamentarian, I'm more than happy that the Austrian parliament has decided the same, to ban his border its entirety. And the Austrian parliament has decided this anonymously. So uh, Austria has a clear position there, no difference to the German position. And uh, I'm uh, sure that Austria would uh, act uh, as Germany uh, has acted and, uh, and, and will go on. Uh, with action against his border terrorists as soon as uh, we know anything about that. Uh, and the others uh, should follow, the other member states uh, who have not yet banned his border in its entirety and the European Union uh, as a whole uh, should follow and it's on our behalf and I'm uh, very grateful to Dietmar Köster and the other colleagues in our Transatlantic Friends of Israel group that we push this issue forward in the European Parliament uh, in order to make sure that the European Parliament decides on that. Hmm. Jillian, um, if I may just like, I'm sorry, to, to, to pass it also onto Matt, because specifically on the question, just very briefly, so we can get also to other questions, but do you think that as a reaction to the ban in Germany, some of these activities, Hezbollah activities, may move to other European countries? It's too early to say, but there are Hezbollah activities already in most of these other European countries. There's a Hezbollah case uh, ongoing in Austria uh, right now. Uh, and uh, if we had time to go through each of the EU member states, I could give you cases in, in, in each of those. I do think that the German action is important for two quick reasons. One, the parliament acted first in Germany too. The parliamentary action has no uh, uh, real teeth to it. Uh, and I think some people were surprised, many people were surprised that the German government ended up taking an administrative action. Um, that's the type of thing we'd need to see in Austria and elsewhere, uh, the parliamentarian decision giving direction and impetus to uh, a government decision. Uh, and the second thing, as you heard, is that it enabled the Germans to engage in raids right away. Mm -hmm under the premise of uh, wanting to prevent the destruction of documents. The understanding was that Hezbollah supporters, operatives, uh, resident in Germany might see this action, realize their activities are suddenly illegal and go shredding documents. And so the uh, raids were timed to the announcement, uh, which is a very efficient way of, of doing things. Uh, and I think that we could see some very significant action if that would happen elsewhere as well. From a U.S. perspective, yes, this German decision is being taken as an opportunity, and there is now increased engagement again across a broad range of um, uh, European allies and a transatlantic effort to kind of come to some real consensus about dealing with Hezbollah in a much more holistic way. Right. Jillian, back to you. Thank you. This next question is for Matt, but please, anyone, feel free to also chime in. Um, it's from Jennifer Weinberg in D.C., who says, the U.S. Congress, time and time again, has tried to pressure the EU into a full Hezbollah designation. In your opinion, why have these efforts been unsuccessful, and what else can be done in order for the U.S. to successfully exert pressure? So thanks, <clears throat> thanks for the question. No, no country likes to be told by another country, um, here's what you should do. Uh, and the only thing they like less is being told uh, by another country's parliament. So the various congressional um, uh, letters, I don't think that they all have a negative effect, but one can't, no one anticipates that they're going to be the measure that's gonna convince a European government to, to take this action. I think therefore that the AJC's uh, transatlantic initiative here is uh, a step forward in that direction. Instead of America coming and telling Europe what to do, you have American parliamentarians, uh, North American parliamentarians partnering as equals with their European counterparts in deciding together what should we collectively do. I think that is something that resonates uh, in a much stronger way. I think this is a very, very important step forward. Uh, and I applaud the AJC and its partners uh, for doing this. The next step is continuing to do what AJC and I and others have done, which is having uh, meetings, public and private, presenting people with the evidence. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've had meetings with European officials where they say, we have no evidence 
Uh, sometimes I will hand them back documents that their government has given me saying, well, here's the evidence that, that you shared with me uh, back in the day, uh, have that conversation. They need to have a, make a political decision that this is something they're going to seriously consider. Then they need to understand that there really is substantive information behind it. And then they can go forward and make uh, a decision at, at a government level. Thank you. Would anyone else like to, to respond to that question from the European perspective? All right, um, so moving on to our next question is for both of our members of the European Parliament. It's from Ilana Weinstein in Paris, who, who asks, you're both members of the Foreign Affairs Committee from the two largest political groups. What are the chances of the committee advancing a resolution calling for a Hezbollah ban? And specifically, what is the mood within your parties for making this a priority? If Dietmar agrees, Dietmar, if you want to begin, please begin. Okay, um, well, um, the SD group uh, is a group where we have uh, sometimes uh, controversial debates uh, about uh, the uh, problems we are facing in the Middle East. But uh, I think uh, there, it is clear for the social democratic group that we must uh, fight anti-Semitism. And nothing is more clearer, uh, which stands for anti-Semitism as Hezbollah, as a terroristic organization. And therefore, I think uh, in the group of the socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament, uh, uh, there will be a broad majority uh, for the goal to uh, ban Hezbollah. I think um, for me personally, this will be um, an important uh, task uh, to work on this. And, uh, but I'm quite optimistic uh, that the Social Democrats uh, will be in favor of this um, and therefore we would uh, strengthen this fight against uh, Hezbollah. Lucas? If I may, uh, thank you. Th and uh, if one listens to Dietmar Köster, one can even better understand uh, how much appreciated his work must be. Uh, and uh, I assume maybe the majority among the Social Democrats and for the whole majority of the European Parliament, we have to convey the message that now it's important, it's obligatory actually when it comes to our interest, but also when it comes to our values to walk the talk. That's it. Mm -hmm. Europe must walk the talk. We cannot only we can not only talk about relations with Israel and its importance and so on and its security. We have to walk the talk, and that means to ban Hezbollah entirely. Uh, I'm confident that the majority of European Parliament will agree with that. And one day, not one day, but as soon as possible, we will have this decision. Uh, anyway, we will tirelessly work on it. Uh, and I know that Dietmar will do that. And I know that also colleagues in Renew Group and in ECR Group and in Green Group, uh, at least in these groups, will work on that. Maybe also in other groups, our transatlantic friends of Israel, network is multi-partisan and also interparliamentary. We are well connected. Uh, and as mentioned in the beginning, the majority understands uh, the importance of the Middle East and of the relation with Israel uh, when it comes to interest and to values. But they have to understand that we also have to act. It's not only a question of claiming something. We have to do something. And uh, on the very left and on the very right uh, of this European Parliament, we will always, not, hopefully not always, we have uh, democratic elections, but we uh, can expect that we will have uh, also in the future there um, people who, who don't understand and who uh, actually work against the good relations, but the majority uh, must be available uh, for this decision. And that's what we work on. And today is an important day for that, actually. Mm -hmm. Today is an important step into that direction. But today, let's say the whole picture is there. We, we have, we have uh, gathered friends, collected signatures, 
build alliances, multipartisan, uh, interparliamentarian in the member states and so on for many months actually and today uh, is an important step into that direction to make it happen uh, as a decision of European Parliament. Thank you. Gillian? Thank you. I think we have time for one more question and my apologies to our viewers whose questions we didn't get to. Um, but this is for all three of our panelists um, from, my, from Naomi Rowe in Berlin, who says, France has traditionally asserted leadership on this issue and, and Europe has deferred. Are there any signs that the conversation is changing even slightly with the French foreign policy establishment on this issue? Matt, do you want to want to start from from? I'm 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 sure you're in touch also with with French officials. Um, so again, I want to point back to this case in France, Operation Cedar. I think it's really significant. In the past, I think France would have been quicker to uh, quietly deport people rather than uh, arrest, prosecute, convict, and jail them. Um, there was the uh, kind of umbrella under which they were able to do this of the partial designation. There were clear um, uh, criminal violations. Um, the charges were not terrorist, they were money laundering, but still it's very significant. At the senior policy level, I don't yet see a change, mm -hmm. but I do see the environment changing around uh, uh, Paris on this issue, and that is affecting Paris. Two primary issues. The first is because of France's historic relationship with Lebanon and with Syria. They're very sensitive to what happens there. There are many people with dual nationalities. There's a lot of shared business interests. But Syria uh, is still in a terrible, terrible position, and I don't see it getting better anytime soon. And Lebanon now has been dragged down into a financial abyss. And I do think that when you talk to at least some French officials privately, they acknowledge in ways they hadn't in the past, mm. the role that Hezbollah has played in that. I'm not saying that Hezbollah is the reason alone for this financial crisis, it is not. There's corruption across the political spectrum in Lebanon. But the uh, type of explicitly illicit activities that have been allowed to take place within the Lebanese financial system have been a very, very serious problem, A. B, I think the French are beginning to understand that when it comes to Hezbollah's ability to not only engage in illicit activity, but to bank uh, in, in Europe, uh, that this is something that is very complicated. And Hezbollah isn't asking, can we open up an account under Hezbollah Incorporated in your bank? Rather, it is the bank account of an individual or a company uh, tied to an individual who is close to Hezbollah. And there are accounts like these. There are joint lines of credit that Hezbollah supporters are maintaining around the world some of those in Europe. And I believe that uh, as, as French and other countries, as their intelligence and law enforcement services are becoming more aware because of the information that comes out of things like Operation Cedar that you simply cannot deny. Um, investigations on the ground in France and elsewhere in Europe, there's a lot of information that's being made uh, public to politicians that are forcing them, at least in part, to reconsider their positions. We are not where we need to be yet in France but there are um, issues that are moving the ball forward. Well, I mean, let me just add that we did have quite a number of, of French signatories from the French parliament, including uh, a vice president. So um, things are maybe sl slowly moving also there. Um, if, if, if Lucas and Dima want to make very short comments because time, time is running out, but uh, may, maybe only I want to underline yeah. that there are also French signatures, uh, signatures uh, for our declaration and uh, the door is widely open also for French colleagues as well as, uh, as well on the member state level as on the European level and um, now is the time for uh, strengthen Europe and to, uh, for sending a strong signal uh, from Europe as a whole. And uh, the door is widely open for, for French colleagues and some of them already have signed. And uh, I look forward to further steps into the same direction. Very good. Uh, allow me, uh, this, oh, me, Dietmar, sorry. sorry. Okay, I only want to add uh, the following. Um, there is not uh, the same political willingness to act as we wish. Uh, but uh, at the moment, I think there is a kind of momentum to be more successful with the ban of the German government of Hezbollah, mm. 
it is an important first step. And if Austria will follow, I think uh, there can be achieved a movement uh, um, in, the, uh, in the French public uh, and that we can achieve a change so uh, that we have a broader consent um, to achieve uh, the ban of Hezbollah. At the moment, there is perhaps, well, let me say, a historical chance. Right. Um, clearly, we have momentum. We will build on it. Uh, Lukas, Dietmar, uh, thank you so much for, for your political work um, and all you're doing. Matt, thank you so much for your, for your expertise, insight. Um, and at this stage, uh, I want to turn it back to, to Jillian. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you all. And now we will hear from AJC CEO, David Harris. Can you see me and hear me, Jillian? Yes. Very good. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to first of all thank my, my dear AJC colleague, Daniel Schwalmfall, for organizing this initiative and, um, and this uh, virtual press conference, uh, to thank Lucas and Dietmar for their parliamentary leadership, uh, and to thank Matt Levitt for his exceptional uh, research and expertise in forming this whole discussion. Uh, I come before you as someone who has been advocating on this specific issue uh, in European capitals now for more than 20 years. I do so, by the way, uh, to Matt's point, not only as an American, but as a citizen of Europe, uh, who believes that this issue um, ought to tie Europe and the United States together, although unfortunately, until now, it largely has not. And I would like to be very clear, uh, having been patient for more than 20 years, in, if you will, revealing my growing impatience. If Europe is serious, about being taken seriously, then how can it explain on the subject of its fight against terrorism, terrorism that has unfolded again and again on European soil, not to mention uh, in Asia, Africa, Latin America in connection with Hezbollah, how could it continue this charade? And it is a charade of this artificial bifurcation of one entity has belonged. If Europe is serious about dealing with Iran, even with its alternative strategy on the Iranian nuclear deal of 2015, how could it be taken seriously if it's willing to close one eye, one eye, towards Iranian behavior in Europe through its designated proxy, Hezbollah? If Europe wants to be taken every time that European officials tell us at AJC and others, we are committed to Israel's security, how can they reconcile that statement which they make, whether in Brussels or in national capitals, with the contradictory fact that they are permitting uh, part of Hezbollah to operate openly, even as other parts of Hezbollah operate clandestinely. If Europe is serious about grappling with the resurgence of anti-Semitism, which AJC first called out in the year 2000 and has unfolded over the last 20 years, and this is a point that, that both Lucas and Dietmar stressed, how can Europe be taken seriously in that fight against anti-Semitism if it's willing to turn a blind eye to an organization that is openly, avowedly, anti-Semitic and calls for the annihilation of all Jews everywhere. If Europe is serious about confronting the war crimes, the crimes against humanity that have unfolded in Syria over the last nearly decade and triggered a humanitarian crisis, a refugee crisis, how can it close one eye and, and turn that blind eye to Hezbollah, which was complicit alongside Iran and the Syrian regime in the commission of war crimes, of torture, of mass murder in Syria. If Europe is serious about grappling with narco-trafficking, then how can Europe 
close one eye to a narco trafficker, Hezbollah, which is operating in, from, and through Europe alone or in concert with other narco traffickers as marriages of convenience? How can it allow this to happen? If Europe is serious about being taken seriously on money laundering, how can it allow a money launderer par excellence, Hezbollah, to continue to operate under the guise of a so-called political win? If Europe is serious about defending its own core democratic values that begin with the protection of human dignity, how can Europe turn a blind eye to an organization that tramples on each and every one of those ideals in its own manifesto as Hezbollah and on behalf of an Iranian regime, which is one of the, the worst human rights abusers on the planet today. If Europe is serious about its commitment to the stability of Lebanon, then how can it allow Hezbollah and its so-called political wing to go untouched, unchecked, when Hezbollah has created a state within a state, a separate army, a confrontation with neighboring Israel, and where Israel has in turn said that if Hezbollah triggers a war, it will have no choice but to hold the sovereign state of Lebanon responsible for the activities of Hezbollah within the borders. And finally, if Israel is serious about its protection of innocent people, how can it turn a blind eye to the fact that Hezbollah weaponizes innocent people, hospitals, schools, mosques, homes, women, and children in southern Lebanon and elsewhere as their front line in seeking to protect themselves uh, against attack. So this notion that was adopted in the summer of 2013, and by the way, only adopted because the Bulgarian government led by Prime Minister Borisov, and I would add the Cypriot government, both showed spine in dealing with Hezbollah when both Bulgaria and Cyprus were under intense pressure to look the other way, forcing Europe's hand, it came up with this halfway measure. Halfway is better than no way, to be sure, but it's only halfway. We at AJC applauded the Dutch decision. We applauded the British decision, which was taken when Britain was still a member of the European Union. We applauded the German decision on April 30th, and as was said earlier, prior to the public announcement of the decision, in at least four German cities, there were raids on Hezbollah-connected locations. Much was discovered. And of course, it begs the question, if there were similar raids in other European countries, what also might be found in those countries? And our advocacy going forward, stimulated by the success of this Transatlantic Friends of Israel initiative, will be to gain more signatories from more parliaments across Europe in the United States and obviously in Israel uh, to continue to raise the level of concern, number one. Number two, let's be very clear. The principal obstacle in our assessment to Europe's confrontation with reality has been in Paris. The focus must be on the Elysee, on Matignon, and on the Quai d'Orsay to begin to help our friends in France understand that their alleged defense of Lebanon's stability by this halfway measure is exactly the reverse of what it ought to be. We hope, as Foreign Minister Heiko Maas of Germany told AJC last month, that Germany will use the presidency of, of the council in order to advance this as, as well and seek closer French cooperation with Germany to make this happen. And we also called upon the High Representative, Joseph Borrell, with whom AJC met last September after he had been announced and before he took office. And we were struck by our conversation with him where he said he was surprised to learn about this EU bifurcation. And he said to us at the time, 
in Spain, we tried to separate the military from the political in ETA, the terrorist group, and we failed. And we urged uh, uh, Joseph Borrell to revisit the ETA issue, to look again at the Hezbollah issue. We will persist because for us, this is an essential issue with respect to the fight against global terrorism, the, flight, the, the fight for our democratic values, the fight for Israel's right to exist in peace and security, and the global fight against hatred and anti-Semitism. Thank you again, Daniel. Thank you to the HAC Transatlantic Institute for hosting this very important session today. Thank you, David. And thank you to all of our guests for such an important conversation on this initiative. I also want to thank our audience for joining us and showing your commitment to the topic discussed here today. In these unique times, while so many of us are separated from our family and friends, AJC is still bringing us together on the issues that matter. Please consider making a donation to AJC so we can offer you more programs like this one and so we can continue our advocacy for Israel and the Jewish people around the world. Please visit AJC.org slash donate. Our next Advocacy Anywhere program will feature Daniel Gordis, Senior Vice President and Coret Distinguished Fellow at Shalem College to discuss why he believes a two-state solution is still wor worth pursuing and the relationship between American Jews and Israel. This program will take place on Monday, July 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. To register for this program and to stay up to date on all Advocacy Anywhere programs, please visit ajc.org slash advocacyanywhere Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Shabbat shalom and goodbye.